So this is the lecture for Michelle Moody Adams' Culture, Responsibility, and Affected Ignorance. We're going to cover five uh, points. The first two points are going to be related to ethics. So these are going to be helpful points to keep in mind for really the entirety of our course. The next two, or the next, the third point doesn't really have anything to do with ethics, but it's an interesting philosophical point. So we'll talk about it a little bit. And that point and the fourth point will help you understand sort of some of the stuff she says about psychology in the article, because it's relatively hard, I think, to understand this part. It's a confusing part of the article. And then uh, we'll talk about a fifth point uh, when we get to it. So first, starting with point number one, what she calls the standard bifurcation of excuses on page 293. So uh, let's look at this part in the article. So uh, she mentions what she calls, she's talking about various views about moral responsibility. And she says, all the views under consideration except the standard bifurcation of excuses into coercion and non-copable ignorance. So the standard bifurcation of excuses into coercion and non-copable ignorance. So what does this mean? So when we're talking about moral philosophy or morality or ethics, a lot of what we're interested in is moral judgment or moral blame or holding people morally responsible for things. So if you uh, burn down the admin building at night, uh, typically we're going to want to say you did something wrong. We're going to want to blame you for what you've done. We're going to want to judge you. We're going to say that was the wrong thing to do. You did something bad. But sometimes we have what we call excuses. So excuses are cases where you do something and it seems like it's the wrong thing to do. It seems like the sort of thing we should blame you for or judge you for. But really we don't blame you or we don't judge you because you're excused. So what are cases like this? Well, the standard division is that there's two kinds of excuses, coercion and non-culpable ignorance. So let's look at number one, coercion. So if it turns out you were coerced into burning down the admin building, so maybe I pointed a gun at you and I said, you have to burn down the admin building or I'll shoot you, or I threaten your family, I say, I'm going to hurt your family if you don't burn down the admin building. Often we think this will excuse your behavior. So we don't blame you for burning down the admin building, we blame me, the person who coerced you into doing it. So the thought is it's not fair to blame people for their alleged wrongdoing if they've been coerced. At that point, it's not their fault. They were forced into doing it. So that's one kind of excuse. The other kind of excuse is non-culpable ignorance. So non-culpable ignorance, this has two parts, non-culpable and ignorance. So let's take a case of ignorance. So you want to burn down the admin, or you, you burn down the admin building. How did this happen? Well, uh, you started a fire on the ground floor uh, because you thought it would sort of clear out the air. The last time you were there, it smelled kind of musty. And you thought, you know what this building needs? A good cleansing fire. So you start a good cleansing fire uh, to clear out the air, but it burns down the building. Now this is ignorance. You didn't think you were gonna burn down the building. You just thought you were going to cleanse the building. But we would probably still blame you for burning down the building. Why? Well, this would be culpable ignorance. So it's culpable in the sense that you're sort of, you're responsible for your ignorance. If you had thought about this clearly using sort of normal rational capacities, you would have realized, number one, this is not how you clear the air. And number two, even if this does clear the air, it's probably also gonna burn down the building. So even though you didn't know, you should have known. You're culpable for not have knowing not have known, not knowing that, you were going to burn down the building. So we don't excuse you for this. This is culpable ignorance. But there's also non-culpable ignorance. So imagine you walk into the admin building and you flick a light switch to turn on the light, but there's some faulty wiring somewhere and the wire uh, causes a spark and it sets a fire and it burns down the admin building. Again, you burn down the admin building, it's your fault. And there's ignorance here. You didn't know you were gonna burn down the building. You thought you were just flipping a light switch. So it's ignorance and it's non-culpable ignorance. You had no way of knowing that this was gonna burn down the building. You didn't know anything about the faulty wiring. 
So in that case, again, we would excuse you. You'd have an excuse. It's not your fault that you did something wrong. It's not your fault you burned down the building because you're not culpable for uh, having burned down the building for the ignorance. So those are the sort of two standard kinds of excuses in moral philosophy. Those are uh, interesting things just to keep in mind for the rest of the course. So are those the only kinds of excuses? Are those actually excuses? When do they apply? Things like that. So that's one important point. And then more narrowly, in the context of this article, this article is about whether uh, being raised in a certain culture can constitute an excuse. So maybe being raised in a certain culture makes you not responsible for doing something bad. And so the question we're asking here is whether cultural influences can excuse wrongdoing in virtue of their tendency to produce non-culpable ignorance. So the thought is maybe you're raised in a culture where uh, we don't understand that it's wrong to do something. So maybe you're raised in a deeply misogynistic culture where women are treated in a certain way and it's just taught to you that this is how women should be treated. And so maybe you think women should be mistreated, but it's not your fault that you think it. You were raised in this culture. And so this is what this, this whole article is about, whether you can be excused for being non-culpably ignorant when it comes to these kind of cultural cases. And we'll see Moody Adams' uh, discussion of this as we read the article. So that's point number one the standard bifurcation of excuses. Uh, point number two, let's go to, uh, this is about empirical or psychological questions, and we go to 294. So on page 294, she's talking about this notion that being raised in a culture can make you non-culpably ignorant. And one of these questions about it is um, whether this is as she puts it, ultimately an empirical question, the answer to which is extraordinarily hard to determine. And she says, Donegan, some author she's talked about, also believes the question is ultimately empirical. He recommends an inquiry into how easy or difficult it would have been for someone raised in a society in question to detect and then correct the errors in that society's moral principles. So the thought is, look, are you responsible? Are you culpably ignorant or are you non-culpably ignorant if you're raised in a society that teaches you bad things? And some people are saying, this is an empirical question. We have to figure it out by looking at people raised in a society and figuring out you know, how hard was it for them to come to the right answer? Like, did they have the resources to come to the right answer even though society was telling them the wrong thing? So just like when you burn down the admin block, we have to ask ourselves, did you have the resources to realize that your cleansing fire would destroy the building? Or did you have the resources to realize that flipping the light switch would destroy uh, the building? And that's a sort of empirical question, basically, in part. Well, it's a question about what sort of evidence was available to you. How difficult was that evidence to find? And so the notion of an empirical question is a question that we can answer sort of by doing investigation into the world. So we answer empirical questions by going out and doing scientific studies. That means in this class, we're not going to ask or answer empirical questions. Or more accurately, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about how to ask or how to answer empirical questions. Why not? Well. That's for the scientists and the social scientists. They answer those questions. We don't. Philosophers do not. That's not our job. We don't have the skills or the expertise. So if something is an empirical question, we pass it off to the other uh, sciences. So how do we deal with those questions in a philosophy course? There are various answers. We could sort of take the answer that seems most correct, or we could say, we don't know, so let's take the possible answers and find out what happens if we go with one or the other or there's lots of other things to do. But what's important is that sometimes an ethical question depends in part on an empirical question. So notice the ethical question, are you responsible for burning down the admin building, depends in part on an empirical question, were you coerced? Figuring out whether you're coerced is not a job for philosophers. It's a job for, I don't know, the police to find out, did I threaten you or not? somebody who goes and studies what happens in the world. 
So I'm not saying empirical questions don't matter to philosophy, but again, we're not trying to solve those questions. So when you come across one of those questions, whoever is coming up with the solution, it's not gonna be you with your philosopher hat on, even if it's relevant to an ethical question. And second, most relevantly for this article, sometimes what looks like or what people say is an empirical question turns out not to be an empirical question. So Moody Adams is going to argue that it's not merely an empirical question whether somebody is uh, non-culpably ignorant as a result of being raised in their culture. So what are her reasons for thinking this? Well, she sort of discusses them in the article, and you'll see them when you read the article. But the point to keep in mind is just, number one, we want to be clear about whether something is or isn't an empirical question. If it is, it's kind of not our job to answer it. We should deal with it some other way. Rather than trying to find the answer ourselves, we should maybe get the answer from another field or stipulate an answer or something like this. And number two, it is our job to find out whether something is or isn't an empirical question, because that will decide whether we try to figure it out ourselves. And Moody Adams, like I said, she says this particular question about culture, it's only partially empirical. In fact, it's also partially philosophical. So that brings us to our third question, or our third point, this idea of underdetermination of psychological hypotheses by behavior. So Moody Adams says uh, this is partially an empirical question about culture and partially a non-empirical question about culture. And one of the reasons she thinks the question is partially non-empirical is because she says uh, what we have is a case of uh, there's radical underdetermination of psychological hypo hypotheses by the data of behavior. So we want to understand two things. Number one, this notion of underdetermination, especially radical underdetermination. And number two, why it applies to this article. So we're going to spend most of the time on this first point, just because it's philosophically interesting. And then we'll apply it to the second point. So the first point, underdetermination, or specifically underdetermination of hypotheses by data. So what is this? What does this mean? So when you're trying to solve a question, especially an empirical question, you come up with hypotheses. So a hypothesis is a sort of guess about the answer to the question. So if I want to know whether uh, the sun goes around the earth or the earth goes around the sun, those are sort of my two hypotheses when it comes to what's, what's going on in space. So what we have is one theory, the earth goes around the sun, and another theory, the sun goes around the earth, or if you prefer, we have two hypotheses, one hypothesis, the earth goes around the sun, the other, the sun goes around the earth. And how do we decide which one is right? Well, you might think, look, what do astronomers do? They, uh, they do a lot of observation. They look up into the sky and they chart the movement of the sun, they chart the movement of the other planets and the stars, and uh, you know they do some math and they work out a model, and then we're good to go. But Notice this was done by people who thought the Earth was in the middle and by people who thought the Sun was in the middle. So some people were looking up into the sky, writing down their observations, and then creating a model with the Earth in the center. And then some people were creating a model with the Sun in the center. And in fact, there were lots of different models with the Earth in the center. And every time you make a new observation, like, oh, look what the Sun is up to, or look what Neptune is doing, or something like that, Whenever you get some new information, one way to interpret the information would be to say, oh, look, it doesn't fit into the Earth-centric model. It fits into the Sun-centric model. So let's throw out the Earth-centric model. Another thing to say is, oh, if it doesn't fit into the Earth-centric model, we have to change the model a bit to account for uh, the, the Earth being in the center. So uh, we'll change the orbits. We thought the orbits were like this, but actually they're like this. Um, if you look at how the geocentric models worked historically, uh, in ancient Greece and ancient Europe, they would add like things called epicycles, where the planets would go on their own little circles and the sun would go on its own little circle in addition to the big circle. Uh, the ancient Indian philosophers had sort of pulsing 
uh, orbits, where the sun's orbit wasn't just a circle, it was like in and out and in and out. And so if you fiddle enough with your uh, model, you can account for basically any observation. And the thought is that what's going on is observations or evidence or data underdetermine which hypothesis to pick. They don't determine which hypothesis to pick. They don't force you to pick one or the other hypothesis. You can always change your hypothesis to account for the new data. And so just the data alone isn't going to be enough to figure out which hypothesis to pick. And in fact, this is sometimes true even if you don't change the hypothesis. So let's say I'm trying to figure out how many cats Professor Yusuf in the English department has. Hypothesis number one, he has two black cats. Hypothesis number two, he has three black cats. And what kind of data do I have? Well, I've seen him with one black cat, and I've seen him with two black cats. Does this determine which hypothesis I pick? No. Either hypothesis could be true. And in fact, I could get much more data, which are pictures of him with two black cats. But look, I just, I can't tell these black cats apart. They all look like the same cat. I know there's at least two, because I've seen two in the picture. But maybe there's three, and it's just only two are ever on camera at one time. So my hypotheses are underdetermined by the evidence that I have. So this notion that hypotheses can be underdetermined by the evidence, this is a notion in the philosophy of science. Some philosophers of science argue that all hypotheses are always underdetermined by all evidence. That's a radical claim, but it's a very interesting claim. If you're interested in this, take a philosophy of science course. So that's one reason I've talked about it here. It's just a kind of interesting idea that it's fun to think about. And then also, let's talk a bit about what this has to do with our article. Moody Adams is suggesting that psychological hypotheses specifically are judged by behavioral data. So how do we judge a psychological hypothesis? Well, we look at the data about human behavior. But she thinks psychological hypotheses are radically underdetermined by human behavior data. No matter how much data you collect about human behavior, it's just very hard to pick psychological hypotheses. You have multiple hypotheses compatible with the same behavioral data that you get. So when it comes to psychology, it's not enough just to collect data. You have to do, do more. And specifically, when you do more, sometimes that involves making ethical choices. What kind of ethical choices do we have in mind? Well, she talks about these in the article, so you sort of see as you read. And this brings us to the next point, which is her discussion of evaluating psychological theories. So we're going to talk about this because this is maybe the most confusing part of the article. It's also not the most crucial part of the article, so even if after this lecture you don't understand it, that's fine. Uh, the reading quiz doesn't really touch on this because this is not the most important or the most crucial part to understand. But since you're going to read it, it's going to be helpful, I think, to have some information. So I have 297 written here, but um, in fact, it's sort of from 294 where this first comes up, up through 297 and even to 298. And she says a lot of things. But the sort of the broad point, the main point that she wants to communicate in uh, these arguments here is that psychological theories are not separate from how people act. Theories that we have about how people act can influence how people act. And this is true of sort of like scientific psychological theories, but also just of sort of common psychological theory, so your own theories about how people act might influence how you and other people act. So if you think people are all lying and untrustworthy and they're all out to get you, that's going to influence how you act. It's going to make you untrustworthy. And that might actually make other people more less trustworthy. If you're not trustworthy, they might not trust you. And so in a way, you'll have this weird self-fulfilling prophecy. Your theory about how people work is actually making people work that way. 
Other times you could have a theory that doesn't make people work that way, but it makes people work in some sort of way. So you might have a theory that people are all uh, greedy and lazy and they just want your money and they just want handouts from the government and they don't want to do any work. And so because you have that theory, you don't help people out when they're in need. You vote for governments which don't help people out when they're in need. And this might make people not greedy and lazy, but it might make them act in other sorts of ways. So it might make them uh, impoverished and they're not going to be able to do certain things, or it might make them more desperate or something like this. So the general point is just our psychological theories can impact how people act. And so when we're judging psychological theories, it's not just as simple as going out and looking at how people act and then coming up with a theory because the theory itself might be changing things, and which theory we decide on might change how people act. So that's the sort of central point, and with that in mind, as that being sort of the main point she's making, this will hopefully help you as you read through this section understand what are her arguments, why is this important to the broader point that she's making, things like this. So that's number four. So. Um, Number five is just a very small point. As you read the article, Aristotle, Kant, and Mill show up in various places. Aristotle, I think, two or three times. Kant, I think, once. Mill, once. And so just keep your eye out for these, because these are the three people we're reading next in the course. I point this out, number one, so you can keep your eye out for it. And number two, just to make a point about uh, why are we about to start reading Aristotle, Kant, and Mill? They've been dead for quite a while. Um, they all have sort of grievous flaws, like Aristotle, Kant, and Mill all said terrible, terrible, morally objectionable things. Uh, so you might think, look, aren't they out of date and obviously wrong? Why are we reading these people in an ethics class, especially not in a historical ethics class, just a, nor a normal ethics class? And there's lots of reasons that we're reading them, not just because they were influential, which is true, but also because they have interesting ethical theories, and the ethical theories are still interesting, and in fact, the ethical theories are missing a lot of the really bad stuff that these people had to say, so a lot of the bad stuff is just not particularly uh, prevalent in the ethical theories that we'll read. And uh, in addition to just being broadly influential, uh, they're also influential in a sort of narrow kind of way, which you can see by the way Moody Adams is using all three of them in her article. So the point here is just to say, this is a bit about why we're about to read these three people. It's because they keep showing up, not just sort of as forefathers, but the questions they talked about are still relevant with us today.